He single-handedly shaped the classical era and is known as the father of the symphony, the string quartet, and even sonata form. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Franz Joseph Haydn. Franz Joseph Haydn was born in 1732 in the Austrian village of Rorau, near the Hungarian border. His family was poor, even though his father was basically the mayor of their little town. Neither parents were particularly musical, although they both loved playing music, and the father was very proud of his abilities on the harp. They were very proud of their son, and tried to do everything they could do to give him a proper musical life, because they knew that he was very talented, but it was well beyond their limited means to provide for him like they wanted to. The poor environment of Rora was not conducive to his musical development, so when Haydn turned six, his parents sent him off to Hainburg to live with a relative and begin proper musical training. Heinberg was not a particularly good environment for Haydn either. His living conditions were somehow even more destitute, and he never got enough to eat. Nevertheless, he studied the rudiments of keyboard playing and string playing while becoming one of the best treble soloists in the choir. His singing caught the attention of a music director in Vienna, with whom he went to study beginning in 1740. The eight-year-old Haydn wanted composition lessons and was promised them, although the music director was much too busy to provide any more than just two. He was still hungry most days, but he was encouraged to sing well because of it, because if the aristocratic patrons who went to his concerts liked what they heard, then they might invite him to their little cocktail parties afterwards and give him some refreshments. Haydn was a great troublemaker and prankster whose sense of humor stayed with him to the end of his life. At one point, his choir was giving a concert near the Imperial Palace in Vienna, and at the time, the Imperial Palace had some scaffolding outside of it because they were doing some renovations. Well, Haydn decides that he and some other rowdy kids are going to crawl up the scaffolding, and Haydn got so far up that he was able to look into the Empress's window. The Empress was not too pleased at this and ordered him and his cronies down. Eventually, Haydn reached puberty, and though he had a fantastic voice, it began to crack, and he didn't really want to undergo castration in order to preserve it. The what have you done for me lately attitude of the choir director meant that they were f trying to find a way to kick Haydn out. Haydn soon obliged with a prank. In a choir rehearsal, he sliced off the ponytail of the kid who was singing in front of him, and he got a whipping and was immediately thrown out onto the street. He was barely a teenager, he was perennially hungry, and with no formal musical training or really anything to his name, he decided that he was going to make it as a musician. But Haydn had a great sense of perseverance, and so he stayed at the house of a family friend while he worked odd jobs in order to pay for music lessons and to try to develop his musical career. He ended up studying under anyone and who would give him a morsel of knowledge, and he would bend over backwards and act as servants to different composers just to try and get that extra little tidbit of musical knowledge. Despite this, one can say that Haydn was primarily self-taught. He considered the Italian Niccolo Popora to be the closest thing he had to a composition teacher, as a guy to whom Haydn was basically a servant for a good while. He composed his first opera and began to get a foothold in the compositional world. When he saw some of his pieces being sold in music shops without his consent, he was understandably angry, but he also realized that he had a voice people wanted to hear. Haydn, though provincial, was always nice and flattering to aristocrats, unlike Beethoven, who would come later. Well, one thing led to another, and he ended up as the court composer to a fellow named Count Morzin. Having pulled himself up from his provincial bootstraps to the position of Kapellmeister, Haydn decided that it was time for him to get married. He had long been in love with a lady named Therese Keller, but when she did not return his affections, he ended up marrying her sister, Maria Keller, in the marriage that was laced with unhappiness from the start. And this was an era when divorce was pretty much impossible and never really heard of. And so they never got officially divorced, but they did live as separately as they possibly could and had a series of affairs. Well, Count Morzin eventually had some monetary troubles and had to let Haydn and a bunch of his other court musicians go. But Haydn's name was out there, and on the free market he was a free agent, and a lot of aristocrats were interested in his services because his name was out there. People knew of his music, and people liked it. He ended up with a job as Vice Kapellmeister for Prince Paul Esterhazy. Their Kapellmeister was getting on in years, and was relegated to sacred music duties when Haydn was brought on. The other Kapellmeister was a fellow named Gregor Werner, and he was highly resentful, and understandably so. Haydn had no real bad feelings for the guy, but, you know, business is business. The Esterhazys were extremely wealthy, even by royal aristocratic standards, so Haydn was given a large orchestra and unprecedented musical duties 
and unprecedented musical control. His extraordinary responsibilities included writing any piece the prince wanted, as well as running the orchestra and putting on operas. At Prince Paul's death, he was succeeded by Prince Nicholas, who, like Paul, was very fond of music, and in fact, he was a decent player of a now obsolete instrument known as the baritone. Many of Haydn's early compositions are written for trios that include the baritone on specific commissions from Prince Nicholas. His musicians call him Papa Haydn, and his rules for running good, efficient orchestral rehearsals are still used today. If the prince or some nobleman were to criticize one of his performers for doing a subpar job, Haydn would immediately rush to their defense, and if the prince wanted to let go of one of the musicians, Haydn would be on the front lines trying to convince the prince that it wasn't the right decision. He felt like he was one of them, and while he took charge, he never elevated himself above their status. And they loved him for it. In one famous instance, the prince built a lavish castle in the Hungarian wilderness. He loved it so much that he moved there indefinitely. His good musicians thought they'd just be there for the summer, as it was intended, and they had family back in town where the actual palace was. And so they, after a while, they implored Haydn to do something about it. And Haydn responded with his famous Farewell Symphony. The Farewell Symphony was one of Haydn's weirdest but yet most beloved pieces. And it ends by each member of the orchestra packing up and leaving, leaving just a few members on stage at the very end of the piece. The prince got the message, and they moved back to the regular palace soon after. As Haydn proved himself a competent Kapellmeister, he was able to renegotiate his contract to allow him to sell his compositions to publishing companies. Up until that point, the prince and the royal family had all the rights to these compositions. They were simply placed in the library, intended only to be heard by the members of the royal family. But Haydn was able to get exceptions and eventually renegotiated his contract to allow this. And this made him very wealthy, and his fame increased because of it. He got around non-existent copyright law by selling the same piece to different publishing houses in different locations and trying to somehow coordinate the release date. In fact, he became so incredibly popular that in Paris, publishing companies would write fake Haydn symphonies and sell them as, oh, this is a work by Franz Joseph Haydn. Oh, people would go crazy because of it. It wasn't even Haydn! But also made a real stink for musicologists who were trying to figure out exactly how many symphonies the guy wrote. Haydn had written an enormous amount of music every year, often in isolation from overarching musical trends. Because of this, though, he was, more often than not, a trendsetter. He was quoted as saying his solitude forced him to become original. And original he became, working diligently until 1790. In 1790, Prince Nicholas died and Prince Anton succeeded him. Prince Anton was not the kind of music lover that his two predecessors had been, and he was able to basically give Haydn free reign to go around Europe and do whatever he wanted. Most of the court musicians were laid off, and Haydn was given a significant pay cut, but he was able to move about the continent, which was everything that he really had wanted. He was quite wealthy, and he didn't really need much more money, but, well, he wanted to go around Europe. He wanted to explore. He wanted to you know, visit these places he heard so much about. So, now in his 50s, he was again a free agent, and he was lured to London by, well, the highest price. He always wanted to go to London, and London had been Haydn crazy for eight years. There was hardly a program in London at the time which was not dominated by works by Haydn. It was like Bieber fever, but, like, objectively better. Sorry, Biebs. Well, Haydn went from success to success in London, but despite his enormous fame, he really never felt comfortable in the social environment, because he never truly got a grasp on how the English language worked. Which is understandable. I mean, just the sight of him sitting down at the piano caused the audience to go wild. He didn't have to even play anything. A few orchestras, in what was more or less a publicity stunt, tried to organize a feud between Haydn and his one-time pupil Ignaz Pleyel. Haydn and Pleyel had no hard feelings for each other and ended up settling the dispute by simply having dinner with each other and endorsing one another as composers. It was kind of a weird situation. Haydn was awarded an honorary doctorate from Oxford, which left Haydn in tears. Despite the fame and fortune and the honors that he had accrued, getting an honor being recognized for his talent was always something that was special to him. When he returned to the continent, he was overrun with more commissions than he could possibly accept. But since he was such a nice guy, he wanted to fulfill as many of them as possible. He would rearrange pieces from early in his career to fulfill commissions that he'd just gotten, or he would try to write pieces that would fulfill multiple commissions at one time. Not only that, but everyone of any social status wanted him at their dinner parties. 
So it's this kind of environment that a young Beethoven shows up and wants counterpoint lessons, and it's understandable why Haydn wasn't able to give him the quality of lessons that he had wanted. Haydn returned to Vienna, where he was once again put in charge as Kapellmeister for the Esterhazy family, although he came back as a part-timer, not a full-timer. His musical attention turned to masses and oratorios. He'd written 106 symphonies, so it was time for him to turn his attention towards larger forces, chorus and orchestra, singing things of religious importance. In 1797, he wrote what basically became the Austrian National Anthem, and this was of particular importance and significance to Haydn. His age finally began to catch up to him, and he felt unable to compose. Like they'd done with his predecessors, the Esterhazys kept him on the payroll until the very end. Haydn's final days coincided with the invasion of Austria by Napoleon's forces. As the bombardment rattled the house, Haydn gathered his frightened servants into his arms and said, Come here, children. Where Papa Haydn is, no one can harm you. When Vienna fell, Napoleon ordered a special guard to be placed outside of Haydn's house so he would not be disturbed. But Haydn was very disturbed. When he heard the news that Napoleon had won, he was very distraught and went over to play the Austrian national anthem three times on his piano. Then he collapsed. He died in his sleep that night. After his funeral, where they played Mozart's Requiem, his head was stolen by phrenologists who thought they could divine some musical knowledge by the bumps on his noggin. At one point, they had to hide it in a straw mattress so it wouldn't be discovered by the authorities. It was finally returned to his grave in 1954. I tell you what, that's a long time to be discombobulated. Haydn's influence on music history is something that cannot possibly be overstated. As mentioned, he wrote 106 symphonies, essentially defining what a symphony was. He did the same thing with a string quartet, although string quartets had been written before Haydn, he was the one who established the fact that they established equality among instruments. That the first violin, the second violin, the viola, and the cello all got the same amount of viable musical material. They all got the melody, they all got parts of the accompaniment. And that is the standard by which all string quartets, since Haydn, have been measured. His music always has an element of humor in it, whether it be from strings acting like they're retuning in the middle of a movement, or loud chords where you expect soft ones, or simply flat out false endings. There's always a fun element to it, and you can't help but listen to Haydn and smile a little bit. As a businessman, he was pleasant and tried to do his best by everyone while maximizing his own income. To that end, he became incredibly wealthy. More than anything, Haydn's catalog is so vast and of such high quality that it truly is a treasure trove for every generation of musicians since.